Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Intelligent Moron with Alex Silva. I'm going to try my very, very best today to not sound so bad, even though I sound terrible. Yes, if you can tell this, I am sick. I got myself sick once again. Um, this is a common occurrence now because of my utter stupidity and what I do to myself. I don't mean to do it. It just happens naturally. Those of you wondering what what did I possibly do, what could I have possibly done to gotten me sick? Well, I was out of town this weekend. I went to Los Angeles and I stayed in a hotel. And of course, you know, it's uh, approaching summertime and uh, when I am in a hotel room, I like to put that thermostat very low, very, very, very low. So I put it at... A brisk 69 degrees the night that I was there, uh, the first night actually. And well, you know, I woke up the next morning not feeling too good. A lot of gunk in my nasal passages, a lot of dried up gunk in my throat, not feeling good whatsoever. I could tell immediately that when I woke up that I had made a huge mistake. And for some reason, people... The listeners of this podcast, if you have been following me from day one, you know that I have done this multiple times. It is not the first time that I've done this. In fact, when I was in another hotel in February, I did the same exact thing. I put the thermostat way too low the night before, woke up, feeling like absolute crap. And well, you know, my dumb self yet again has made that same mistake within the span of three months. I would say even less than three months since I've uh, done this same exact mistake. It's actually, you know, become one of the things that I do ever so often. And I guess I never learn because I always feel like when I go to a hotel room, especially now because summer is upon us, I want it to be as cool as possible, right? I want to take advantage of the coolness while I can and not have to worry about it being hot in the hotel. Well, there's nothing wrong with putting it at a nice 72. I put it at that the second night I was at the hotel and I found it out. I found out that it was not hot one bit, that it was perfectly cool. And I did not need to put it at 69 because apparently lowering the, the AC by 3 degrees will put me in a very sick state. And I blame myself and nothing else nobody else I can't blame no one else but myself for putting me into this circumstance yet again you know when I get sick usually this this uh, type of sickness it gives me a a uh, sniffly nose runny nose stuffy nose congestion and I sound like an absolute idiot and I think that you know with this uh, being such a common occurrence I deserve this. I am the only one who has that control, and I've done that in the past two times I've been to hotels. So I guess, you know, moving forward, I'm never going to touch a thermostat ever again if I'm in a hotel. Now, I was with the ho- in the hotel room with, with my family, so, you know, they let me do whatever I wanted to, and I did it, and I was just, you know, it, it was a bad choice. And no one else, by the way, got sick other than me, just me got sick, which is weird. So I guess it means that that my body just cannot handle cold air for that long of time. I think that that is just what happens. I, my body, my nose, my lungs, my, I just cannot handle cold air for that long. Cold, dry air destroys me from the inside out. I don't know why, I don't know how come, I don't know when it started, all I know is it just d- destroys me. So I, for future reference, will never be doing that whatsoever ever again. I will never touch another thermostat and put it that low again. I can't. Unfortunately, it ruined my entire trip. 
by the way, I went to uh, Los Angeles this past weekend. I went to go see my brother graduate college. It was quite the event. It was a fantastic outing. You know, I very much congratulate him for doing what he did, accomplishing his goals, and now he's moving on with his life. Fantastic. I would have been able to enjoy it a lot more, obviously, if I wasn't feeling so bad, you know, because the first day we got there, we went to Universal Studios with him, and we had a good-ass time, and I haven't been to Universal Studios within, like, maybe a year, a year and a half. Awesome place, I have to say. You know, I think that Universal Studios is an incredibly fun theme park if you love movies and if you love cinema, which I do. So it's always a win for me. Now, unfortunately, with this past trip, I do have to say that I think that the ticket prices at this place have gone way too high. I think it was like 125 the total for was or was for one ticket at Universal Studios. Last time I went, I'm pretty sure it was like $84. So I don't know what they did or what, you know, they made them increase their prices at Universal Studios, but 124 I think, was, 125 sorry, was uh, a lot. I think I mentioned, like, maybe when I went to Disneyland, I think that the tickets were, like, 180 which is even more too much but you know 124 i think is is a lot to be asking for uh universal studios which doesn't have the most rides most does not have the most rides has some pretty good ones i'll give it that but not the most in my opinion it's also a not the biggest theme park you know it's uh built on the side of a mountain which uh is good and bad. Good for views. The views are sick. I will give it that. That the views are breathtaking. If you go down to the lower lots of the of the theme park, you get to see those views while you travel down the mountain. But besides that, um, it's all kind of weird. It's a weird um, theme park being built on the side of a mountain, which doesn't have many rides, like I said. But in the near future, I believe next year, we'll be getting a new Fast and the Furious ride. I think it's called Hollywood Drift, is that the name of the ride, which will be coming out, I believe, next year or the year after. But that was the first time of me hearing about that at all whatsoever. So when I saw the sign, when I saw the construction happening, I was like, oh, thank God, finally, a new ride, which should be a good one because Universal Studios... Doesn't have a lot of popular franchises, but at the moment, Fast and Furious has got to be still, even though the movies are kind of stupid now, their best franchise out there. Their best franchise rolling, running right now. So, I'm super excited to see that ride whenever it gets, you know, whenever it's finally, you know, open. But, you know, I think that, you know, them building that ride, and you can see the construction of where it is. It's still going to be on the side of the mountain. You know, they're, they just got to carve enough out of the mountain in order for them to build that ride, which is insane to think about. You see the construction and where they're going to build it. It's like, there ain't no flat ground here, fellas. It's like, what are we doing? How are we, How's this even going to happen? But, you know, I'll leave it to modern engineering and modern um, architecture, and modern building to figure that out and not me because I have no idea what these guys could be doing or how they could be doing it. All I know is that they're going to do it. Now, will it be good? Hopefully. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But it's a fun place. Universal Studios is quite the fun place. Like, it was my first time also actually there to experience Super Mario World. So that was actually kind of cool. I haven't been there, obviously. The last time I was there, the part of the park that part of the park was under construction and we were not allowed to see any of it and uh, this is my first time seeing it and my first impressions were was holy cow this part of the theme park is tiny i mean it is small it is a small part of the theme park and you walk in there and you're like oh no like you gotta be kidding me like they, they, they only gave this bit of the park to Mario and his boys? 
this is it. You know, I was a little disappointed, I gotta say. You know, Mario Land is not, is maybe about the size of a good size, like, courtyard. Like, it's not that big of a, uh, of an area in, in uh, Universal Studios. So I thought that, you know, walking in there, I was like, it, it looks good. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, it looks awesome. The atmosphere is good. They got the Mario music playing. They got all, like, the the mushrooms. They got the blocks. They got the, uh, uh, the like, props of the Mushroom Kingdom. They got Mario, Luigi, Toad walking around, meeting and greeting, waving at you. It's pretty cool. Um, but it's just so small. It feels like when you walk in there, you're like, oh, my God. Like, these poor sons of bitches were not given enough space to make, like, a true, like, area of the theme park. Like, this is just, like, some small little cutout of the mountain that they were able to get to make this because they got the theme park rights to Super Mario. But nonetheless, though, Let's talk about the one thing that really matters about this whole theme park experience, and that is rides. Now, Super Mario World has one ride only, Bowser's Challenge, which is like a, which is based off of Mario Kart, where it's essentially the ride is, if you've ever been to Disneyland, then you know this ride. It's a, essentially an upgraded version of Buzz Lightyear's ride, which is just a, uh, you're on like a, like a track, and then you shoot like the, uh, you know, Zerg's bad guys along the way to score points against your friends who are in the ride with you. It's essentially that, but you work as a team to take down Bowser in a Mario Kart themed ride where you're on a track and you just gotta, you know, get all the item blocks that you can, and then shoot the items which are just like shells at Bowser's henchmen. And that's how you score points. And that's how Team Mario, which is you, beats Team Bowser. Now, this is an upgraded version because it uses, in a way, augmented reality. And I'm thinking to myself, like, are we going to be getting, like, Apple Vision Pros in this shit? Is it going to be, like, an Oculus, a MetaQuest? Like, what are we going to be doing here? Well, it's not as high-tech as you would think it would be. So the ride itself, the cart you're in is pretty badass. It's, like, modeled after, like, a Mario Kart cart. And then you get like this little headset that you put on and that you strap into. And it's like almost like a visor type thing, right? And then when you get into the actual ride, you get this little, uh, like this uh, screen that goes over your eyes. That's like an adapter that, that, that kind of like uploads like the VR type of experience, the augmented reality experience. So in this little VR, uh, uh, HUD visor that you get, which is not that great, by the way, it's a little cheap in my opinion. Uh, that's where you see all of Bowser's henchmen on the track that you are driving on. You know how, like I said, like in Buzz Lightyear's ride, you see them like it's practical, right? It's like on the walls. It's like these like mechanical machines that you point the the laser at and you shoot at the target. Well, this is all in the VR headset, the augmented reality. So you just kind of have to look in the direction and put uh, push the button to shoot the item, and that's how you score the points. I gotta say though. It's kind of a fun, it, it, besides the, the augmented reality being a kind of janky and a little cheap in my opinion, it's still a pretty fun ride. So I think that, you know, the Mario Land, you know, wh- while it's a super, super small area of the, of the park, and it's a little underwhelming in that sense, being so small, the ride that it has to offer is a fun ride. And I think that the ride itself is sort of worth seeing. Because the line for this ride is the longest line that they have at the park. I mean, like, you would think that because the park is so small that this the, the line for this is pretty small. No, no, my friend. Like, this has got to be the longest line for any ride at the park in Universal Studios, like, I was shocked to see how long this line was. This line not only goes into, like, a tunnel and, a, and, and you know, all this stuff, but it goes, like, zigzags and spirals and twirls and stairs and a maze and a, these secret passageways and up until the... Yeah, there's, like, a lower level and a top level and a middle level of this thing. Like, the line for this ride 
is so goddamn long. Like, if they shorn the line a bit, they probably could have fit in another ride in the park, in that section of the park. Like, there is no reason why this line needed to be this long. It, it, it It's actually preposterous on how long that this line is. Like, they could have fit in another ride in, 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 and substitute for how long this line is because it is so long. Like, I don't understand it. You feel like that there's like this, some sort of like, oh, this is going to be a great ride, which it is a pretty good ride. But I also think that most, some people could find it a bit underwhelming if I'm being completely honest. Like, it's not like the most like, you know, um, entertaining ride it's a it's a fun ride it's definitely pretty pretty cool but it could have been better i think like if you could pro you know what happened to old-fashioned roller coasters you know like there ain't that there is like really none at universal studios it might be because they're built on a mountain that kind of makes sense but you know these all these indoor uh rides at universal studios you know, it, it, it's got to be because they're built on a mountain. Like, there's no way that they could build, like, roller coaster tracks and stuff. Like, it wouldn't make any sense. So, I get it. I get it. You know, I, I, they're, they're, you know, tied down a bit. But I still do think that, you know, the ride is worth going on. I think the land is worth going to. I think that it's worth uh, going to Universal Studios to see Super Mario World. Um, But maybe if you're, like, you know on the fence about it if you're like thinking to yourself like when would be the best time to go pretty much now I think is the best time to go like like there wasn't that many besides the Mario ride like the rest of the lines for the rides weren't that long um there isn't like a reservation for Mario World anymore like you can just go in whenever you want and, and that's it um and, and check it out, like, there really is, like, I, I think, like, now might be the best time to go see it, just go if you want to, but just, you know, be aware, I think, I don't mean to be a big Debbie Downer, right, but maybe tone down your expectations a little bit, you know, just because when you walk in, I, I if you haven't been, and you're wanting to go, I do think that you will say, oh, shit, this is, this is small, you know, this is, way smaller than I thought it'd be. That's what she said. Um, so maybe tone down a little bit of your ex expectations. I wouldn't go in thinking like you're going to see this enchanted, gigantic Super Mario World um, and be super pleased about it. But, you know, if you're you're going there for like a swell, small time and you're thinking like, well, let's just go and have a little bit of fun. I think you'll have like a nice little bit of fun. You know, and I know you're probably thinking to yourself like, well, Alex, if I'm spending $125 on a ticket at Universal Studios and you're expecting me to have a little bit of fun, then why even go? True that. Got a good point there. Got a good point there. But like I said, if you love movies, there's more to see from it. Like, I love movies. I love cinema. So there's more to see, in my opinion. There's, there's this little movie magic that kind of goes along with going to Universal Studios. You know, not all of it is just about Mario. Mario is a good, solid piece of it, but there's also better rides. Like, you know, in my opinion, the Mummy Ride is a very, very underrated ride. That is a roller coaster, but an indoor one, so it's kind of limited. Um, I wouldn't even call it, I guess, a roller coaster, because I guess you'd have to... Well, it is on a track, but it doesn't really go, like, that crazy. I mean, there's no loops. It's not, like, outdoors. It doesn't go that particularly fast but it is pretty quick would you consider indiana jones at disney a roller coaster i don't know but um that's a good ride the the jurassic world ride which i don't really care for jurassic world i'll be honest but the ride itself is pretty fun like the ride itself is like got a good drop it's a water ride you go and get wet i got wet you know you live and you learn right um that's a fun ride um but yeah, the, the 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 one of the better selling points for me is also the Universal Studios like lot tour, which is pretty cool because you know, I've been on it maybe about like three or four times and uh it's always the same. 
But because it's the 60-year anniversary of the Universal Studios theme park uh, and the tour, no, I think it's just the tour, um, they had some special stuff that was a little bit different. Like they had, if you've been on it, they had they had changed a few things. Like for one, um, there was like a, 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 a the movie Nope that came out. I think like a couple years ago, there was like an entire new segment of the Nope set that they had in in the tour. They also had a portion where you can get down and actually see and walk on the set of the Bates Motel. And I believe the the film Psycho, which is also pretty damn cool. I've never seen Psycho, but walking around that set was pretty awesome. You know, being a part of like history, like this is where they filmed that scene in that film. Like that that to me was pretty incredible. You know, and they had like props there. You can pose with like the shark from like uh, uh, one of the sharks from Jaws. They had some of the cars from Fast and the Furious. Um, you can take a picture next to the Bates Motel. Um, it was pretty freaking cool, I gotta say. It was pretty awesome. Um, so that was pretty cool, too. The, the updated of the tour, which I will say, you know, sometimes the tour um, is always magical for me, but also there's, a, I think, a few portions that they could, you know, maybe update a bit, like the the interactive stuff, like the, the Kong and the Fast and Furious little things that they show you. Which is like when you go into this part of the of the ride, the tram goes into like this tunnel, which is like a, like in like a like a three sixty screen, like you're like in this like little like immersive like uh, um, show that they do for for King Kong and Fast and Furious. Honestly, with those things, I, th- I think that they can probably do without, especially like the the Kong one, which was, you know, a movie that came out in two thousand five and it's been around for a long time. And, you know, the, the, the Fast and Furious one for me is so cheesy and so lame. Like, I don't want to see any more of, like, Vin Diesel and the family doing some outrageous shit, you know, for, like, a good 10 minutes of the of the tour, you know. So I could deal without that, you know. I could deal without that stuff. Maybe update it, change it up a bit. Besides that, the trip, you know, was good besides me getting sicky-wicky. Um, besides Mario Land being small, besides, you know, um, you know, the tour being a little repetitive, the trip was great. We had some good food as well. Um, went to Shake Shack on the day we left. Um, that's always a great spot. I mean, I, I will, I don't know if I will go to bat for Shake Shack over in and out but Shake Shack has always been a delicious burger, that I think that a lot of people in California don't try or have this uh, bias towards in and out which I completely understand. But if you have Shake Shack, you will see that, oh yeah, this place also makes really, really good burgers. I think if you try them, it'll be worth your try. And you'll be like a little bit more open-minded to the fact that, oh, I can see why people think that this is better than in and out Like there's a point here. There's a point to be made. There's a point to be heard and a point to be tasted that this could be possibly better than in and out And I do see the point. Will I go there fully? Probably not, just because I'm biased. But, you know, there definitely is a point. There's an argument to be made. There's a debate to be had between in and out out in and out versus Shake Shack, in my opinion. You know, it's uh, it's it's got a really good, really good tasting burger, really good tasting beef. One thing that I noticed about this time when I went, though, is that the burgers, the patties themselves, had a really nice crust to them. Now, what I mean by that is if you're not, you know, a culinary expert, you know anything about the world of cooking, when uh, you can get, like, a nice crust on the burger, which is, like, when you, like, get it really hot... So that the sides of the burger got like this little crust to it, like a little little crispiness to it. It really adds a an element of um, fanciness, an element of uh, exquisiteness, of touch, of uh, flavor enhancement. You know, it just really does tie a bow on it. You know, put some frosting on your cake. You know, it, it, it's it really does add just that little oomph that makes it like, you know what. We really know how to make hamburgers and cheeseburgers here 
and this is how good we are, and this is how good we can finesse these burgers in Jesus Christ. As I was devouring that burger, I was like, oh my god, they went the extra mile on this one. Like, the, these taste phenomenal. Like, I can't get enough of this flavor right here. But yeah, if you haven't been to Shake Shack, I highly, highly suggest that you try it and give it a shot. Because if you haven't, and you're like really naive to other burgers out there besides In-N-Out, or besides wherever, you know, local burger joint is like, known for in your state like I know that Texas has water burger the east coast has shake shack the west coast has in and out like if you haven't like you know broaden your horizons and tried the other ones you really should and 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 decide for yourself because at the moment right now in and out is still number 1 but dude shake shack is like it's right there it's really right there i mean all right, moving on. A little bit of gaming news. This is actually going to be something that, you know, the general public who views this will be like, oh, well, this is a good thing. What could go wrong? While gamers who know will truly know this game's fate. And this is a, not even a story, but like just like a little bit of a, you know, a thing I saw today. Kirk Herbstreit was on the Pat McAfee show, and he was gassing up, I mean gassing up, the new NC, the new EA Sports College Football 2025, or EA Sports College Football 25, which is coming out in, I believe, July. You know, he was on Pat McAfee's show talking it up and being like, you know, EA is really, really taking this game seriously to provide the the best college football experience out there in a video game. And he was hyping it up and he was, you know, saying that it's going to be really good. They're taking attention to details of the schools, of the colleges, at the stadiums of those colleges. And that they're really, really trying to make a, a great, great, great college football video game experience. Unfortunately, Kirk... You are being paid by EA. You are also going to be lending your voice to um, bring that game to life in terms of commentary, right? In terms of in-game commentary. But unfortunately, Kirk, you don't know, you don't really know how bad of a company EA is. You may be telling me that they are putting their heart and soul to make it the best experience that they can make and give that to the fans of college football you may be saying this and I think that you know you're in the right to because you're th th these people are paying you to say this but you're not fooling anybody you're not fooling no one I'm sorry sir but but us as gamers know that EA is one of the most evil 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 publishers to publish video games that have ever existed. Just think about the, the history of Madden, the history of FIFA, the history of Anthem, the history of all the games that have come out under their name as EA being their publisher, and seeing their uh, reception, seeing how the game does, seeing how people continue to be at the utmost pissed off about how their games come out and how little to no detail or little to no effort is being made to make improvements to the game, bringing in straight up stripping the game of core features that made that game popular in the first place. I think that, you know, EA at the moment is really selling it very, very hard. That they are, you know, that they have like the next generation of college football video game that's going to be their best ever. And I got to admit, you know, I got to admit, I, I know the trailer for NC, the, for college football 25 came out last week. You know, it came out with the song of Welcome to the Jungle and some pretty slick air quotes gameplay. Um, I got to tell you, the trailer was hot. The trailer was sick. It got me going. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll actually 
play this game. Maybe I'll pick it up. Maybe I'll try it out. This trailer with Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses, I'm like, you know what? This seems like a fun time. And then I remembered. Then I remembered all the scrutiny, all the lies, deceptions, and all the corrupted, evil shit that EA has been accustomed to and doing for years and years and years. And I thought to myself, like, wait a minute. You tell me that the dudes that make Madden, that have not made a good Madden game in eight years, that people and fans of the game have called them out for making little to no changes to seeing to 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 claiming reskinning and not putting in any effort to make anything and just roster updates from year after year after year on this game that that for some reason the college football version of of this game is going to be good now, what makes you think that they wouldn't just put the college football skins on Madden and package it as a new college football experience? There is no evidence whatsoever for me to believe that EA is actually going to make a good college football video game. And as much as Kirk Herbstreet wants to pony up and be... EA's simp and EA's poster boy and EA's marketing team to promote this game as much as he has to on the Pat McAfee show. You ain't fooling no one, Kirk. You ain't fooling nobody because we know. We as people who play these games know exactly what this company EA is capable of doing and how evil they can be in putting out these games and telling you that it's going to have this, it's going to have that, this is all going to work, and, you know, I just don't buy it. You know, these guys are the kings of selling you unfinished products as video games. For $70, my, may I, might I remind you, $70, you know, basic edition of College Football 25 is $70. I wouldn't even play Madden, I wouldn't even buy Madden for $70, you know, there's a reason I think that these games, Madden included, that go to Game Pass so quick, which is Xbox's version of a subscription service to play games, you know, as as long as they're on the Xbox Game Pass service, right, how could anyone think that this game is going to be worth buying $70 day one? That's the basic version. Imagine if you're a super college football fan and you want the Deluxe Edition. And I gotta admit, the Deluxe Edition looks pretty cool. The cover looks sick. I have to admit, it looks really, really cool. But will I buy it? Not a chance in hell. Unless EA decides to completely shock us all and put out like one of their better games that they've ever made. And it would have to be one of their better games that they've ever made. And and make it an entire authentic college football experience that is once in a generation. And they're like, you know what? Yeah, we haven't put out one of these games in, what has it been, like 10 years? We need to make a comeback and we need to make it so it is so good that people won't have any other opportunity to play it but to buy it and to make it actually good and the word of mouth has to carry for people to do that will ea actually do that though it's a very very slim chance it's a super slim chance in my opinion i feel like this that that there's no chance just because of what they've done to fifa and what they've done to madden and you just know like you 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 have to know that these guys already got like a like a college football ultimate team cooking right now where you will have to spend money, money, and money to get a good experience or get to get the ultimate team experience. Like imagine this, right? Imagine ultimate team is like, you know, you, you know, you build your own team from the ground up, right? They could easily have like a cool mode where that is not even a thing. 
but you know college recruiting could be a cool 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 like thing to do in this game will they have that though probably not because they pretty much stripped like the career mode in in Madden to something so 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 mediocre that people who play Madden can't even call it that because it's so bad um the college football world where it's at right now with the transfer portal and how crazy it could get, like they could capitalize on so many cool things with that new format that even if they were to put out Ultimate Team, I don't think that people would play it unless they're totally willing to just give away their money just to do that lucky pack bullshit thing. But if you actually put out a pretty good college football experience, will they monetize it? That's the question. I'm thinking to myself like, they could go crazy, right? What if, like, what if, like, in this game, you're, like, limited to, like, so very little schools, right? And in order to get the good schools or in order to get the good conferences, you got to pay an extra penny to get those conferences. Like, say the game launches, right, with the, uh, with the Big Ten, the, the, the Big 12, and, uh, the ACC, right? What if it launches with that? I could see EA. I could totally see this happening. You want to play on the with the SEC teams? You got to fork up another 20, 30 bucks just to play those teams. I could totally see that happening. Even though it would be the most evil thing possible to college football fans to have to fork over 20 or 30 more dollars to play with the SEC teams. Because think about this, bro. NFL's got 32 teams, right? College football, you're expanding that to at least like 100 teams, right? At least 100, right? If you're really going to be college football, right? And that's a lot of money, right? That's a lot of, you know, logos, a lot of uh, um, stadiums, a lot of uniforms that they got designed, a lot of, like I said, a lot of logos in general, which logos from the schools that are going to require some money to have that, you know? Um, I feel like it's just uh, so much to even think that they're going to have all this available day one. I don't know. Maybe I'm just like over, you know, over doomsdaying it like it's going to be the worst thing ever. I'm not a huge college football fan, right? So I don't really think I don't have that much, that much high expectations for this game. But if someone was, you know, someone from the East Coast or the South or even like in like uh, the Midwest, right? Who love college football? Who th- who who like it's like part of like their being, they're part of their existence, part of their identity, part of their culture. And this game comes out. It's like the first in like ten years, like I said, maybe even more. I'm not too sure. And they're like, I don't know, I want to play as my school. I want to play as I want my friends to be able to play as their school, and we can have like matches or games like rivalry games and stuff like that. Like that would be so cool. For it to be, you know, limited in some capacity, some capacity would be absolutely tragic to those people. Now, the question is, is EA going to bank on those people to for their college football fandom to pay extra to get more stuff? And will they do it? Possibly. I mean, EA might be banking on it because there's little to no information on what truly is going to be in this game. We've only had the trailer... A couple breakdowns of gameplay, but that's about it. We haven't really seen the full-fledged game yet. And that might be enough to, for me at least, to be like, signal the warning flag. Like, hold on, this is... Can't endorse this. I, I can't tell you to buy this. This this does not seem like something that you should be buying and using your hard-earned money on this. It could be potentially a scam. I don't know, but, you know... From what I've seen, EA puts out a lot of pomp and circumstances in their stuff. Trailers look awesome. Game looks like shit. You know, I can only suspect in my experience with EA, in terms of FIFA and Madden, they don't really deliver. deliver. So with a EA College Football 25, I feel like it's going to be a disaster. Like an actual tragedy. Maybe even worse than any Madden ever coming up because of how much pressure and how much this game is going to cost to make. And how EA is so money hungry and so evil in that sense. 
where this all this entire game could possibly be fu- fueled and funded by microtransactions and um, battle pass type, you know, um, content, you know, content drop. You know, I could totally see these guys implementing a battle pass in this game. Where you gotta play the game, and then you, as soon as you you play more, you unlock more things. But only if you buy the battle pass or buy the college pass, or they could make it something like so, you know, oriented with college, like uh, you know, fit in with college, like oh, buy your tuition to get more stuff, or or take out a loan to expand the teams that you want. Like oh, I could totally see that happening. In EA being like, oh, this will be fun. Like this is a real college experience. Like. Where really no one gives a shit. No one cares about that. Just let me play as Alabama. Or let me play as USC. Or UCLA. Or Oregon. Or, you know, Auburn. Please. Florida State. Anybody, you know. This seems like it's going to just crash and burn. I could be completely wrong. And I hope I'm I hope I'm wrong. But knowing this company. And knowing how, you know, Kirk Herbstreit is doing his job. Like I said at the beginning of this segment. He's doing his job to sell this game best as possible. Where does he go? Pat McAfee Show, one of the 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 the, the most watched sports program right now in the United States. Pat McAfee Show. He's going to be there. He's going to get the eyeballs. The ears are going to be listening to what he has to say about this game. I understand that, Kirk, that you're saying this, but I don't think you've been told the full truth of what's really going to happen by EA and by your bosses at EA for this project. I don't know. I just feel like this is a total sort of a misdirect. Not even a misdirect. He's he, he's he's saying what he's supposed to be saying. I'm saying that he's not misdirecting us. But EA surely is misdirecting us to what really is going to be in this game. And I think that when we fully, truly get our hands on this game... People will be disappointed. It's just bound to happen. I already know it. It's just, it's going to happen. 100%. I can feel it. All right, moving on. A little bit more of entertainment news. Um, Yesterday, a video and a picture dropped to promote the uh, the new Witcher season, which I can't believe is still a thing. Uh, it's still happening, apparently. Even though it's a, a shitty show, it really is. Like, The Witcher on Netflix, if you haven't, noticed or you haven't had any interest to watch it i don't blame you at all it's a terrible show actually terrible i haven't even seen the third season but i heard that the third season was even worse and seasons one and two but uh it's a really bad show you should not waste your time on it the fact that netflix thinks that this is going that this is like one of their premiere shows and this is like the best that they could do as a premiere fantasy air quotes show uh, it's, it's awful. It's an awful TV show. Uh, but nonetheless, they're, they're still trying to be relevant and still trying to get people to watch this show. Even though they, they've got the, 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 the odds stacked against them, meaning, uh, they lost Henry Cavill. He no longer is going to be playing Geralt of Rivia, which I mean, you know, as, as, much as I hated the show, I really did hate it. Uh, he was, I guess, uh, one of the reasons why I watch the show because I think that he's a good actor. He seems like a cool dude. He likes The Witcher, and uh, he he gave it his all in what he was given. You know, he he decided to leave because of obviously creative differences. They were not going in towards the direction of the books and doing some other things, which I don't really care about. But he did, so that's why he left. Um, got no problem with that, got no problem with him leaving, if he felt like he didn't want to be a part of it, he surely is able to leave in turn, in, in, within the realms of his contract, which apparently he was, um, and Netflix decided to put out a little, little sizzle clip, little, little thing that, to get you hyped for the new Witcher, still Geralt of Rivia, but being played by, uh, Liam Hemsworth, you know, Chris Hemsworth is a younger brother, which uh, I don't have anything bad to say about Liam Hemsworth at all, I think he's a fine actor, I think that he's he's good at whatever, he's, whatever he does, I do think that it is kind of weird for Netflix to be like, promoting like, oh, the new Geralt of Rivia, like, you know, we, we have our guy, like, he's a good guy, look at him, he's Liam Hemsworth, uh, we got our guy, 
you know, look at the new Geralt of Rivia. Kind of weird for them to be doing that. I feel like, you know, it's it's like almost like a, uh, you know, a backstabbing to Henry Cavill, who's like, you know, y'all didn't want to go in the direction that you said you would, so I'm out. And then they're like, kind of like, like, sort of talking shit, like, look at the new Geralt. Well, it's like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a little weird. You know, I, I got that vibe with that. Um, but uh, nonetheless, he has been confirmed, well, not confirmed, but finally shown off in the role of Geralt of Rivia. And uh, I think it I think it looks horrible. I, I got to admit, I think that the, the he, he looks terrible. Um, I think that uh, it looks... I don't know. I just feel like, you know, the, the I'm so used to how he looked before. So, like, and I thought that he looked pretty damn good as Geralt of Rivia. That uh, this is just kind of a sad attempt to be, still be, like, relevant. Like I said, you know, Henry Cavill is, like, the best part of that show. But by no, like, by no, like, actual thought. By no actual, like, coherent thought. By no one who has a brain, who has seen this show, is going to tell you that this is a good show to worth and worth watching. Like, this is a terrible show. Like, this show is not good. The fact that they have Liam Hemsworth to be the new Geralt of Rivia does not surprise me whatsoever. Like, I don't think he looks very good in the role. Just be from this small thing that they've shown us. But even then, like, I know, like, even if he is, in a way, better than Geralt of Rivia, I don't even know if the show could be good with him, you know? I don't know if the show could be good even with Henry. I thought it was bad with him, and now Liam's there, like, like there is, like, zero, zero, zero momentum for this show moving forward. Like, you think about it, the show's had some three disastrous seasons they had a spin-off which was terrible like pretty much unwatchable they've had a couple animated shows that are not very good where is netflix you know what does netflix see in the witcher that they think that this could be some kind of like you know game of thrones that they that they hoped it would be but clearly is not you know it's just not game of thrones it's not what they expected it's not what the they intended it to be you know, you lose your lead guy. Now you bring in Hemsworth. You're like, well, this should bring up some buzz. I don't know if it is. I think that it might be doing the opposite. People might actually not watch it because Cavill is not there. I mean, I feel like people are just kind of, you know, watching the show because of Henry Cavill at this point. The show, when I was watching the first two seasons, like heavily, I feel like it needed that guy for me to like it, any of it, which is crazy to think, but like, it's kind of true. And the, the whole second season, I, I, I watched the second season. It was just a disaster, you know, when it wasn't all about Geralt. I'm like, why do I care about this? Like, none of this is good. None of this is worth watching. None of this, none of this is worth caring about. Give me more Geralt of Rivia now. We don't even have the guy that we want to see in the role. So what is the point of watching the show? Listen, I think that... You know, Netflix is in deep trouble. Netflix is in a some hot water, not just because of, you know, they have bad shows, they do. But this show in particular, that was supposed to be their Game of Thrones. Their new high-budget fantasy show. How bad it is, and how terrible the response has been to the show itself, the recasting of Geralt, and now to the present, how bad it looks how bad he looks, how bad the show overall looks. I don't know. I just feel like this is not something that I would ever watch again, and I don't think that anybody's going to end up watching this, I'll be honest. Sticking with streaming services for a little bit more. Um, Comcast is being nice to us. They are um, trying their very, very best to combat inflation and to combat the prices of everything going up, including the prices of streaming services. Now, what might they have in store for us as customers of their beautiful service? I am a user of Xfinity, and I love their internet service. Well, their solution 
is the uh, um, Stream Saver bundle, which is the uh, the bundling of Netflix, Apple TV, and Peacock for fifteen dollars a month. Now I don't know if this is a, a premium um, subscription to both uh, three of the services, or if it's the basic one. I, I would lean toward it might be in the basic one, but I do think that this is reminding me of cable bundles, reminding me back in the day when they used to bundle cable stuff. Channel packages, ring any bells for anybody? You know, uh, this is the same old shit that we've been used to, just in a different format. The bundling of streaming services. You know it must be really bad for these companies when they have to bundle their streaming services for you to stick around. This is actually embarrassing. You know, we, we thought that these companies, I thought, would never, ever, ever, and, and as long as they existed, team up with each other to be a part of a bundle for another company. I mean, this is absolutely insane to me. Like, I think about this Apple TV, Peacock, and Netflix. I think that this is just an absolute loss for these companies. Like, they are truly losing money by the fortune where they have to bundle each other. And this isn't the only one. I've heard that Disney Plus and Max are going to bundle two together sometime soon, I think. We'll focus on this one because this is also crazy. But the fact that they're bundling together really must mean that these guys are really struggling big time. Comcast might be struggling too. I mean, like, like these companies, these streaming services really don't know an answer. They don't know what to do. They're spiraling out of control. They got to join forces just for subscribers to stay because they got nothing. I mean, I'll be honest, man. You know where I... There was a shock in my life where I noticed that I no longer had... I no longer... I I, I, mean, I, I no longer had the best plan for streaming. You want to know what... How I figured this out? I was watching Fallout on Amazon this year, this past month and a half, two months ago, when I first started, I was greeted with an ad. I was greeted with an ad that I had never been greeted by before. An ad. at the. At, I was like, hold on a sec. When did you fuckers change this? When did you fuckers decide to put ads on my plan? Sir, I am paying for Amazon Prime and I get this subscription. I get that uh I, I get a prime video along with that. How much more do I gotta pay to keep this up? I was actually disturbed by it. I was like, why the fuck am I getting an ad? I was actually furious. And I thought to myself, well, you know what? It's 2024. All these streaming services have gone up in price. I should have expected this. I should have been like, why? I mean, they have ad plans on Netflix. They have ad plans on uh, Disney+. Plus. They have ad plans on Hulu. They Actually, they've always had ad plans. They have ad plans on uh, di- uh, what uh, um, uh, Peacock, Apple TV. Like, I should have expected this to happen so if i was to assume that this bundle the stream saver bundle for comcast has got to be full of ads absolutely full of ads i just i i can see it now every single subscription on this has got to be ad full you know i you know i i gotta admit you know when i got that rude awakening when i was watching fallout Phenomenal show, by the way. Phenomenal show. And, uh, you know, I saw, like, the ad every beginning of the episode. Thank God it was only one ad, by the way. Still not okay. Not okay. I I just feel like nowadays I'd rather have cable. I I probably would rather have cable now because you got to pay so much now to have these premium ones. Some of the premium ones don't even have 
don't even let you not have some of the plans don't even let you not have ads bizarre bizarre what what's happening why are we going back are are, are it, it must be true they're all out of money it it's got to be true i mean i i i don't see like any like oh no we're doing fine actually uh, we, we uh you know we made our quarterly uh you know everything's going good we're looking forward to next quarter no 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 that's all bullshit bullshit i don't buy it one bit couldn't believe that bundling bundling not two but three subscriptions serve three streaming platforms being bundled together i can't believe it last thing i'll talk about before i get out of here a little bit of sports, um, actual sports, not video games. Um, the Boston Celtics won Game One of the Eastern Conference Finals against uh, Indiana against the Indiana Pacers two nights ago in overtime fashion. Right, Jalen Brown hit a three to send it in overtime to tie the game, and um, the Celtics ended up winning the game. I like, I want to say like five or six points. I can't remember, but a uh, pretty close game throughout good game too. When I was driving home on Tuesday, I was listening to the sports talk radio. And uh, one of the points that they brought up was, uh, um, what do you give the chances? You know, one to five, one being the least five, get five being the most um, that the Pacers can beat the Celtics. And a lot of people were giving them fours. Some people are giving them fives. You know, pretty high chances to beat the Celtics, the Pacers, to beat the Celtics. And I was like, that you know, the Pacers play really good, you know, basketball. They play fast-paced basketball. They play good good team basketball. Their bench is pretty deep. They're hungry. They're well coached. They give them a pretty good chance. Yesterday, you know, Boston almost felt like they weren't really ready for full on Indiana like it seemed like they were like kind of downplayed Indiana a little bit I know that the Celtics won the game but Indiana felt like that they could have won that game as well Tyrese Halliburton was just feeling it um everybody on that team was feeling it like the the Celtics at points looked like they were barely holding on you know they got saved essentially by uh, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum didn't play this best game but you know still had a very good game but um, it also brings up the question that the Celtics, you know, being the the best team in the NBA uh, playoffs right now, and even the best team in the NBA season overall, um, the pressure for this team is gigantic. It's 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 so big. Yeah, how much this team is under pressure to win the finals? I think you know. Being there last year, knocking on the door in the past like three years to win the title, pretty much the same core, Jalen Brown, uh, Jason Tatum, um, those two guys at least. Being there in Boston, you know, being part of the Celtics, you know, Joe Mazzulla's second year, um, knocking on the door, as we said, being the best team, like I said, in the in the, in the in the NBA season overall, um, and look at the teams that are left, Indiana Pacers, uh, Dallas Mavericks, Minnesota Timberwolves, three other teams that uh, have not even sniffed the NBA Finals within the past five years. Now, somebody who's looking at it who's not watching the games would probably say that this is gonna this should be given to the Boston Celtics, that this should be an easy win for Boston to win these finals. Now, if you are watching the games and you know how good these other teams are, you'd be like, well, not so fast. Indiana has been proven that they could really, really put, you know, you know, pump, uh, hit the, you know, um, hit the pedal to the metal with these guys, take them all the way, possibly. And then in the West, I mean, Dallas, possibly. Minnesota definitely could take it to the Celtics too. So, this has got to be like the year, the season where the the Boston Celtics are under the most pressure to win this championship more than ever, more than ever. I mean, they didn't, we didn't get the matchup that we wanted to with the Celtics and the Knicks. We were robbed of that from the Pacers, but the Pacers had proved them to themselves 
and proven to me that they are a team not to be messed with. Like they are a team that can certainly beat you any given night when they're playing good, and they're coached super well too. And I think that, dude, for real, honestly, like if the Celtics don't win this, these finals, like it, it might be like we really need to think about what's going on with this team. Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, like, what do these guys need? Like, what else can we provide with them? Because we we've paid them. What 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 else can they we give them to get to win this? Another coach, more pieces. What do we do? Or is it them that just cannot get it done? In my opinion, sometimes, you know, from what I've seen, sometimes the Celtics just sort of get in the way of themselves. They start too late. They don't really engage quick enough. They don't react quick enough to like what's been happening. They can't dig themselves out of these holes that they're in. Um, and I think with a team like the Pacers, who can just blitz you and run past you, they got to be careful with that. I think that if the Celtics lose to the Pacers, they, 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 they lose the series to the Pacers, they can be in some deep trouble. Like Moving forward, like... What do we do here? Do we blow this up? Do we keep moving forward? Like, what do we do? I, I, I'm not the person to make that decision. What to do? Um, but if I was, I probably would think about like getting a new coach. In my opinion. Uh, but it's crazy to think about. You know, they, they, they were right about that on that radio show. Like, the, these guys are under the most pressure to win a title. Like Boston Celtics, Boston in general has not had a title in basketball. In a long, long time, like more, like since two thousand eight, like they've been dying for one. Will they get it done? I don't know. The way that the Pacers were playing last game, they definitely are going to be tested. But I, I mean, we'll see. I mean, like Porzingis is not supposed to come back for a while. Um, and right now the 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 Pacers are like pretty much completely healthy, so like it's going to be tough for them. But the utmost pressure on the Celtics because they are clear, clearly are on paper the best team remaining in the playoffs. So there's no reason for them to not get it done. The only reason that we I guess you can sort of blame would be themselves if they don't win. You know, is it really it's gonna be on Jason Tatum. It's gonna be on Jalen Brown. It's gonna be on Derek White and then Joe Mazzula as a coach. Like it's gonna be on all of them if they don't win, in my opinion. Uh, that's that's just what I think though. That's going to be it for me today, people. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Remember, you can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube at Intelligent Moron with Alex Silva. New episodes drop every Thursday morning. Make sure to like, subscribe, rate, review, and do all that good stuff. Yes, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will see you guys next week.